I think the system we have now, there's so many ways it can elect somebody that a lot of people don't want that this is a pretty easy change to make to keep some bad things from happening. And so I think it's pretty easy to advocate for. From the McCourtney Institute for Democracy and the studios of WPSU on the campus of Penn State University, I'm Michael Berkman. And I'm Chris Beam. And I'm Jenna Spinelli. Welcome to Democracy Works. Today, guys, we're talking about ranked choice voting has been in the news a lot. Once again, right on top of what's yeah, happening in right, the world. Right, right, cutting edge. Yeah. Cutting right, edge. because uh, in New York, they just passed, uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in uh, New York City, right, right? New York they City. just passed uh, a uh, bill, I guess it was, mm-hmm. that uh, a law that uh, they're going to start using ranked rights voting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And That's we a saw big it. deal. That's a big city. Yeah, <laughs> big city. Yeah. Joining us today to talk about ranked choice voting is Bert Monroe, the liberal arts professor of political science, social data analytics, and informatics here at Penn State. He's also the director of the Center for Social Data Analytics. And um, Bert uh, does does a lot of math as part of his research, but uh, I don't think he's going to make us do too much today, which which at least for me is a very good thing. But this, this I think, speaks to, uh, you know, ranked choice voting is just one example of different conversations that we've been having about the rules of how people are are elected, kind of who can controls those rules. Um, we had an episode on, on open primaries, for example. Well, I think the, there have been the rules, others. Yeah, the rules that structure our democracy mm-hmm. right, about voting, about Procedures. seat allocation. and Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there have been all kinds of uh, discussion this year. And we've had some on the podcast, some just, you know, out in the ether about, for example, the Electoral College and how uh, that set of rules affects uh, presidential outcomes. We've had lots of talks about gerrymandering and how the decisions about how you're drawing legislative districts affects politics. We had a recent guest on about open primaries and so about the rules that structure the uh, choosing of delegates, which vary quite dramatically from uh, from state to state. Uh, one thing that strikes me about this discussion of rules about ranked choice voting is that it feels relatively nonpartisan to me in the sense that I don't know that anybody has a really solid idea that moving to ranked choice voting is going to help one party or the other. Yeah, I'm not sure I think that's true. Um, why is that? Well, because I see a lot more uh, – I see a preponderance, not exclusive, but a preponderance of um, arguments against it coming from the right. I think that uh, Republicans are very antsy about the uh, Electoral College. And so it, given that that's a procedure and given that some people feel like that is anti-democratic, any – thought of changing any procedure for that reason feeds into a narrative that they don't like. The other thing is that because this is so, you know, because partisanship is balanced on a knife edge so in so many communities, states, et cetera, and the nation as a whole, you it's very, you know, likely that a small change would make a big impact. And so, and I think overall, you're just more likely to have candidates on the fringe left than you are on the fringe right. And I don't know if that's true, but I think that might be the perception, and that's why it makes them nervous. I mean, one thing that strikes me about a lot of the rules discussions that we've been having in American politics these days is that they're often about what I think of as anti-majoritarian rules. And these have largely benefited the Republicans much more than the Democrats. So whether we're talking about the filibuster or gerrymandering or the Electoral College, these are all anti-majoritarian. But we also know, because we talk about Federalist 10 right. in here all the time, that our democracy was really founded on the idea of protecting minority rights. And in fact, the most liberal democracies have provisions to protect minority rights. Now, whether that goes too far in a lot of these anti-majoritarian sort of rules is a debate that we could have. And in fact, a lot of our discussions about democratic erosion have had to do with the fact that it's, you know, that we're moving towards the uh, development in some places of illiberal democracies. And and we're seeing the push for gerrymandering reform, the push for open primaries, the push for ranked choice voting. It's all kind of of a piece, right? People are are organizing and are, are going in this direction because they think something is wrong or something is broken. Yeah, good point, Jenna, because I, I think what we're seeing a lot of these days is people starting to focus on the rules a bit more. I mean, I don't remember so many discussions about the Electoral College, but of course, we just had this you know, right. remarkable... Well, we've had three, right? Right, but this one was really tremendous right. <laughs> because, you know, it lost by three million votes, which right. is not, mm-hmm. not, not insignificant. 
significant and gerrymandering has really been since the 2010 election has really been in the public discussion. You know, there are other ways I think that the public really doesn't appreciate the extent to which rules give us the outcomes that we have. And I mean, in particular, I'm thinking here about the two party system. You know, I, you will often hear people complain, why don't we have more choices? Why do we only have two parties? Well, the rules are set up in such a way that you're almost always going to end up with two parties. And the fact that it's very hard for small parties to take to uh, to get any kind of a hold or a place in the legislature in Congress means that we don't really have any effective third, fourth parties. Mm-hmm. Again, because the rules matter, but there is all kinds of room within a democracy about how you're going to set up the rules of a democracy. Okay. Right. And as, as a podcast about democracy, we should explore those variations and the, the, the things people are doing, the ideas people have, and uh, you know, bring people on like Bert to, to talk about them. Yeah. I mean, and one of the reasons that people talk about uh, this ranked choice voting is that the outcome of it is, is that it should allow smaller parties to, uh, to have more of an opportunity to win. Well, I think, I, you know, I just want to reiterate uh, Jenna's point that this is all driven by a fairly universal sense that of dissatisfaction, right, that, that things are not going well. And one way to uh, engage that, one way to respond to that reality is to look at the rules, look at the procedures. And so I do feel like that is, is what is driving a lot of this, and, and, it's, and it's worth investigating. All right. Well, let's hear from Bert. Yeah. So uh, let's go to my interview with Bert Monroe and hear all about ranked choice voting. This is Jenna Spinelli here today with Bert Monroe. Bert, thank you for joining us on Democracy Works. Sure. Happy to be here. So we're going to talk today all about ranked choice voting um, in the news a lot right now. So to, to start off, can you tell us what it is and uh, how how it came about. Who thought that this would be a good way to, to organize voting procedures? Ranked choice voting is used to describe a lot of different systems, but mostly what people mean is something that's usually referred to as instant runoff. So most people are familiar with runoff elections. You vote as you normally would, and if no one gets a majority, Everybody but the top two is eliminated and you come back in four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks and ha- and vote again and somebody has a majority. Ranked choice voting does that all at one time. So voters rank the candidates uh, in a pure system from first choice to last choice and uh, the votes are tallied based on the first choices. And if no one has a majority, then the last place candidate is eliminated. And the voters who had voted for that candidate first, their vote is transferred to their second candidate. And it goes on and on till there's a majority. It's I'm told it's a lot like American Idol voting, which is everyone votes on all the all the contestants and the last place one is eliminated. And then everybody comes back and votes for who's left and on and on until there's just right, one. Right, right. But except it all happens, it all happens at the at, same time. At the yeah. same time. Yeah. So if there are four candidates on, on a ballot, for example, do you have to rank all four or, or whatever number is, is on there? Well, that's one of the things that varies depending on the place that has implemented the specific rule. Um, The only place I know of that requires you to rank everybody is Australia, which uses it for their national elections. Most places you can rank, uh, you can rank as few as you want. Um, If you rank only one, that's called bullet voting. But uh, most of the uh, U.S. variations of this uh, you can only rank up to a certain number. Uh, the New York one that just passed is five. I believe San Francisco's three. Um, and uh, yeah, but you can you can vote for as many as as you like, just as long as you don't vote more than one for first and more than one for <laughs> yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess it's. You know, is it is it something that I mean? I think we're all kind of familiar with with rankings on on some scale, whether it's you know, 
uh, some type of survey we might have filled out or even thinking about like our review culture online these days. We give people five stars or four stars or whatever. I mean, is this something that, that voters typically understand how to do or that there there's, um, I guess, how does it compare in terms of like ballot errors to the, the, the traditional select one candidate per per election? Well, it is, it's clearly more complicated than just ranking one, just checking a box or filling in an oval. But uh, it seems to, and this is one of the common arguments people put against it is that it's more complicated. But uh, there were, the most studied system in the U.S. is San Francisco's, and uh, there, the, there didn't seem to be much problem, uh, certainly after a couple variations of, of this had been had been done and it seemed to increase turnout even um, so people seemed to feel they had m- more ability to express what they what they felt and uh, so it it arguably broadens the the electorate yeah the other uh, thing that you know people um, point to is that it it encourages candidates to campaign differently because they're perhaps trying to to win over a, a broader plurality of of the the uh, voting population. Can can you speak to that the way that this method might change the way a candidate campaigns? Yeah, there. This is one of the key points of contention about how this system works. One of the main arguments for it is, as you say, that it. Uh, encourages candidates to maybe negative campaign less to try to broaden their appeal so that they can get those second choice, third choice, fourth choice. And that seems to be largely what what happens, um, although there, there are examples where it didn't. Um, Fiji had this system or still has this system. Uh, and adopted it for the reason that they had a lot of um, antagonistic ethnic-based voting. And in that case, the electorate was so polarized that uh, more extreme candidates were able to get first more first choices and moderate candidates were, were punished and didn't get enough first choices to stay in the race. Yeah, sure. So the the, the camps on, on either side really like drove up their bases and got their bases to rank them first, and then there there was like no one left in the middle to rank them first. Right, right. The um, I I think I skipped earlier uh, w- what the main reason for for this is is there are lots of elections under our current system where uh, votes are perceived to be split and a candidate other than who we think a majority would really prefer gets elected. Um, there, can, can you give us an example of that, sure. that that folks might might remember? Yeah. So there are some famous ones uh, in presidential elections. Uh, the Bush-Gore election, Gore lost by 500 votes or something like that, but 5% of the whole Florida vote uh, went to Ralph Nader. Uh, and it was thought that uh, if those had gone to Gore, he would he would have won. Uh, there was a similar argument that uh, Trump beat Clinton by less than the margin of people who voted for Jill Stein. And right now in Kentucky, they're arguing over the governor's election, which was very close, uh, that the Republican candidate who appears to have lost narrowly would have won if the libertarian had not been in the in the race. Right. So in the in the kind of ranked choice system, those votes for third party candidates, if if those voters had also ranked one of the, the majority party candidates, their votes would get kind of cycled back through the system. That's exactly right. So if they can both be more sincere about their true preference for Jill Stein or Ralph Nader or wh- who, what have you. But there's, when tho- those candidates don't win 
don't make the the cut of uh, on the first choices their second choices are presumably the one the more moderate that's closer to them and it also it's very handy for elections that have lots and lots of candidates uh like primaries we're experiencing right now um new york uh is anticipating 17 candidates in one of their races coming up for advocate, I think it was. And so you can imagine if you're just picking your first choice, somebody could win with 17 candidates, somebody could win with 5% of the vote. Um, well, not 5, 10. <laughs> and uh, so it, it helps with prevent these spoilers and the ticket splitting. Yeah. Kind Vote of splitting. the maybe maybe a, a a counter argument to that like large number of candidates. I guess is there any pressure or or any any reason to think that, you know, somebody who is a low information voter, right? So they go in there and they see 17 candidates. And now I I mean maybe they're they're restricted so they can only pick three or five or, right. or uh, you know, what have you. But let's say they really only know something about one or two of them. They just pick the other couple at, at random. Um, yeah. d- does that happen? And I guess how, how might that impact the, the, uh, the uh, results overall? Yeah, um, that's definitely uh, a thing. Uh, you know, e- even in our current system, there are spoiled ballots that people fill out wrong. But there, there are two ways I'm familiar with that this happens. One is, uh, I think I mentioned bullet mm-hmm. voting, which is just voting for one. And uh, there's an argument that low information voters or elderly voters may have more difficulty. Uh, and those votes are more likely to be, I think the term they use is exhausted. That is, uh, their candidate gets eliminated and they don't have a second choice for it to pass to. So their their vote isn't used in the final, in the final tally. The other one I'm familiar with is Australia, where they, everyone has to fill out all the full ranking. And there you get a phenomenon called donkey voting, (laughs) where people rank just in the order they appear on the ballot paper. Um, So if they're alphabetical, they vote alphabetical. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And that happened uh, in one or two percent of votes. And so Australia now randomizes the order on the ballot so that that washes out. So you you mentioned uh, voter turnout earlier. So so there there is evidence to suggest that that ranked choice voting might might increase voter turnout. There is. Uh, it's it's always hard to to attribute increased turnout in a particular election to to one thing because many things change. But uh, again, in San Francisco, there was dramatic turnout raised uh, in the first election that used this. In some districts, it went from uh, in the teens, like 17 percent, to over 50 percent. So really dramatic um, changes that there, when there wasn't any m- much obvious else that was different about the election other than other than the ranked choice option. Did that persist? I mean, it was, was some of this just the novelty, like people want to go in and try out the new thing and, and see what it's like? It's hard to say. <laughs> there, the, the argument is that people want to be able to express themselves, um, what, what they really want, and this helps people who might otherwise want to vote for a candidate that doesn't have a chance or they think doesn't have a chance um, to vote. We've seen in the U.S. ranked race voting most often used in municipal kind of city, city government, local government type of races. Is there is there something about those those elections that makes this a better fit or is it, is it more just that 
um, the the adoption hasn't quite gotten beyond the the scope or the scale of of individual cities. Well, I think it's um, there are just more cities than there are <laughs> states and United States. Um, there there is one state that has adopted yeah, Maine. Ranchers, Maine and used it in a congressional their last congressional election and will use it in their hmm. presidential election next year. But uh, it's it's an experiment uh, that cities are willing to try. It it was very common. Uh, experiment in the early part of the last century. It started in Ashtabula, Ohio, <laughs> and but faded for a variety of reasons. Um, but now it's used in, um, as you say, a lot of cities, mm-hmm. municipalities, San Francisco, Oakland, mm-hmm. Minneapolis, Memphis, uh, Sarasota, Florida. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so thinking about Maine, so what's what's different uh, when it's a, a state level or, you know, um, federal office as opposed to a, a city council or, or something like that? Well, the the stakes are higher. Uh, they're, they're more partisan because they're tied to national politics. You're less likely to get independence, although Maine is famously – comfortable for independence. Yeah, <laughs> and, and from what I understand, that was one of the reasons that Maine went this direction in the in the first place? I believe so, that the the partisan lines were more are more blurred there and they elected an independent governor and an independent senator. But uh when they when it comes to these higher stake elections, there's uh obviously m- more to lose for people, um, and so those that are likely to lose are likely to object, um, and there are uh, legal questions about whether it's constitutional and that sort of thing, which have have met court challenges that happen in Maine, um, and but any voting rule change creates somebody who could have one that didn't. <laughs> yeah. And so that will object to the change. Sure. Yeah, and and they and Maine will also use this to to pick their their uh president in in 2020, is that right? That's my understanding is they uh both in primaries and the the general election and they it's it's not for their governor but it is for primaries mm-hmm. uh in special elections, in in state elections. Yeah. So, are, as as other states are are thinking about this, are there things that they can learn or take from from Maine's experience about maybe how to how to do things differently or or how to improve upon this kind of pilot that Maine had in in twenty eighteen? What the process in Maine and the process we just saw in New York was this happened through a referendum. Uh, in Maine, it happened through two referendums. Uh, one, the first one was somewhat overturned, and the second one was said to say, no, we really meant we want to do this. So as with anything, that uh, if you've got popular support and it's not something that one group of politicians is trying to impose to maybe for honest reasons, mm-hmm. but maybe perceived as manipulating the system, uh, then those seem to be more successful. But there are examples where this didn't work. Uh, Burlington, Vermont uh, adopted it and uh, didn't like the outcome, apparently, of of a mayor election and uh, had another referendum and got rid of it. (laughs) Um, well, so. Tools of democracy, I suppose. <laughs> That's right. Um, what What do the parties think about this? Do they see it as as a challenge to their power? Well, this is interesting. Um, there's There's not really any reason to think of this as particularly partisan, um, but it does seem to be being perceived that way right now. Uh, there was a Fox News headline yesterday playing off AOC uh, endorsing the New York referendum, and the headline was AOC Gets Her Way, (laughs) um, which I assume was meant to 
say this is bad. Yeah. <laughs> Another part of it may be there's an argument uh, that ranked choice voting encourages uh, more women to run, more people of color to run. They're more likely to be elected. Uh, that was that seemed to be the case in San Francisco, for example. And obviously, there are partisan differences across across those groupings. Putting ranked choice voting specifically aside for a second, are there other experiments, for lack of a better term, that 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 people are thinking about or or toying with as 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 a way to improve what they might see as problems with with our current system? Sure. Um, well, there's the the most dramatic one is the fact that almost all of our elections are for one person at a time um, in districts and that sort of thing. And instead, many countries around the world and many cities in the U.S. Uh, have systems that are more proportional. Uh, they're less majoritarian. They're... Uh, Smaller groups can can get an official elected on, say, a city council or something like that. Um, and there is a form of ranked choice voting that does that called single transferable vote, which has all of the same uh, mechanics except instead of a majority. So I'll, I'll do a little math here. Okay. All right. <laughs> you're electing one, you need 50%. We all understand that. Uh, if you're electing two, you need a third. Mm -hmm. Got it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. And so on. If you're electing three, you need a fourth. Yeah. And um, no, more, no more than three candidates can get a fourth of the vote. Oh. So uh, the way that works is you rank the ballots, and uh, if nobody has that amount to be elected, then somebody is eliminated and votes are transferred. But you also have, if somebody gets more votes than they need, extra votes are transferred to those second choices. Um, it's, uh, I'm told the Iowa caucuses look like this in live uh, as people abandon losing candidates and shift over to give a candidate that needs just one or two more when they're with somebody who has enough for a delegate. And there are variations of that that are used in the world and in cities yeah. around the U.S. But that, that would be the, the, most, the most dramatic change uh, would happen as a result of that. Um, and that would likely be more parties um uh and uh less less polarization but more fractionalization mm -hmm. more more smaller parties that right. sort of thing right. and uh that's not a change to be taken lightly but uh it's it's something people like to think about uh, yeah and i mean in in looking at you know groups like fair vote which is a big advocate for ranked choice voting they say all the time that it's it's more small d democratic do do you agree with that yeah i do um i i think the system we have now with the it's called plurality right. voting where you just vote for one um there's so many ways it can elect somebody that a lot of people don't want that this is a pretty easy change to make to keep some bad things from happening um and so i think it's i think it's pretty easy to advocate for something like proportional representation is is something that needs a little deeper thought i think mm -hmm. yeah so um you know, obviously, with seeing ranked choice voting uh, get approved in in New York City and and the the example in in Maine, there's there's you know, kind of pockets where where it seems to be be picking up traction. Um, I, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but do do you see more states um, you know continuing to adopt it or it, it continuing to spread moving forward? I think so. The momentum is certainly in that direction, um, and more people are frustrated with electoral outcomes and aware of rules affecting outcomes uh, 
more people seem to be aware of gerrymandering, more people seem to be aware of the Electoral College. And so I think that push is in that direction. Uh, the politicization of it could push it the other direction. Um, it It is notable that I, I, I mentioned Minneapolis and Memphis, but most of the list is San Francisco, Amherst, Massachusetts, yeah, pretty, Cambridge, pretty Massachusetts, yeah, New yeah, York. Yeah. So it, I don't think it's quite ready for Peoria yet. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, yeah. Well, Bert, um, thank you for helping us understand and, and for not making us do too much math today. <laughs> we, we appreciate sure. that. Uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Jenna, and thank you, thank you, Bert. I think he did a, a great job. I'm not at all surprised in laying out how ranked choice voting works and uh, a bit about the implications of it. Uh, I think we should talk a little bit about what it is that people hope ranked choice voting is going to accomplish and w- why people don't like it. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. yeah, I'm not actually sure why people don't like it. I get that it can be a little bit, you know, a little bit more complex, but. I don't know. You walk into a voting booth, you usually have a second choice in your mind. No, I think that's right. And I mean, the argument is that this idea of ranking makes it uh, or handicaps the low information voter. People who are looking at that ballot don't necessarily know anything about all the people on that ballot. And so you do have a risk that people are going to pick people for second, third and fourth that they don't know sufficient enough sufficiently uh, they don't know enough about them to be able to make a good choice an informed choice i suppose i think just that attitude uh actually devalues the role of lower information voters well i I mean there's there's no obligation that you be completely informed before you walk into the voting booth in in fact I, i often find when talking to my students and asking them about why they don't vote you know a really common answer will be i don't know enough to do it And, you know, I try to explain to them, I don't think that there is a requirement that everybody walks into a voting booth, knows everything about everything on there. That's why we use cues. And that's why there's parties. Yeah, Yeah, we use Mm -hmm. partisan cues. We use the cues of people we respect. And, you know, we use the cues of our roommate if we think that they know what they're talking about. I don't disagree. I had a friend in uh, in Wisconsin who would see what his neighbor put up in his lawn and know at that moment that he was voting for the other person. (laughs) Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> it worked. Right. I do want to pick up a little bit on on what some people hope to gain by do, by using uh, this ranked choice voting. And one is to perhaps create a less negative campaign. You want to well, explain it, a little bit about why that would I work? Mean, that it way? Just, I mean, nobody – I mean, again, not a lot of evidence one way or the other. But the, the, you know, but the argument just kind of well, stands Well, there's some evidence reason. actually that it, is le- that it is less negative. Yeah. I mean, there, there's starting to be enough – uh, municipalities out mm-hmm. there anyway. Mm-hmm. There's only one state so far, but enough municipalities that are using it that there can be some research that's that's been done. And uh, we looked at some of it before right. we came mm-hmm. on here. And there seemed to be some suggestion in that that, uh, you know, there does seem to be an incentive to not alienate voters who might, you know, might want to pick somebody for their second or third choice. In other words, you might want to be the second. Yeah. You might want the votes of some of the uh, right. fringe candidates that you know are not going to win. And so it's not in your interest to, you know, run negative ads against them. And, you know, you will find... Well, not certain... only of fringe candidates. Well... You sh- just want to be careful who you attack because you may need their you may need their second choice. That's true. I think maybe more important, especially to, uh, you know, to democratic legitimacy is the idea that you're much less likely to elect somebody with less than a majority vote. And in fact, you know, Bert explained a little bit how you, although I wasn't sure I agreed with his example of Jill Stein, but, you know, you could see an election where, you know, a, a Republican gets 30 percent of the vote or 40 percent of the vote and a Democrat gets 40 percent of the vote and then 10 percent of the vote goes to somebody from a, a party further to the left than right. the Democrat and or, or the Democrat gets 30 percent of the vote. So the Republican <laughs> wins with less than a majority, even though the majority actually opposed that candidate. Right. It is clear that there's a very significant minority of the American populace that feels like they don't get an opportunity to express their opinion in the political process because they are constrained to vote for either a Democrat or a Republican. And I, I think it is legitimate to try to figure out a way to um, 
um, allow those people to express their point of view and still be engaged in the final result. And I and I just think that ranked choice vote, voting does that, and it does that with 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 I think a minimal um, amount of. Um, potential negative impact. Yeah, I, I I agree with that. Although you know, Bert Bert mentioned it was more of a kind of just a one-off kind of statement, but uh, you know that I know comes from uh, his background studying as a comparative politics scholar. Uh, that often the kind of fragmentation that you get by having multiple parties, you know, is isn't such a good outcome yeah. in and of itself. So I mean, there are advantages to sure. two-party systems as well. Sure, I mean, and. Um, and we in the United States are just overwhelmingly aware of the negatives associated with the two-party system, right? But, I mean, you know, there is no perfect system. There is no perfect structure, perfect set of procedures. It's just a matter of what are your objectives and what's the best way to achieve those and, and how do you balance those, right? Yeah. And and again, I mean, I just think it's it's just entirely – Appropriate at this. I mean, we we are in a position. If you accept the idea that we're in a position where democracy ain't great right now, we didn't get here overnight. We're not going to get out of here overnight. It's going to take a lot of different little steps to change it. Why not try this? Sure, that, and and you know, it might be a good point to mention. Bert kind of mentioned this, but didn't go into it at all. That you know, there's no reason you can't do this. I mean, there is no real constitutional mm-hmm. challenge to it. Uh, the Constitution is pretty open on this. It says, you know, each state can prescribe, it's a quote, the, quote, manner of holding elections. So, you know, states can come up with all kinds of methods for, for how to run elections at all different levels. Yeah, and and, um, and this is the, and, the, the yeah, laboratories so, of democracy, right? And, right. It'll and be so, interesting to see what happens in Maine. And, you know, and if it becomes, you know— Really close, and and Maine ends up being, uh, you know, and have any an impact on the final results. Well, hold your hold on to your horses, man. It's going to be a crazy, a crazy set of circumstances. But I think a lot of this stuff comes down to just nomenclature, right? You just hear instant runoff and voter and and um, uh, rank choice voting, and you're like, which is which, and what is it? And I feel like after Bert, you know, anybody who listened to that just comes away with a pretty simple, straightforward, clear understanding of what we're talking about. And that's probably 90% of the battle. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. thanks to him. Yeah. Thanks to Jenna. Thanks to all of you for listening. I'm Chris Beam. I'm Michael Berkman. This has been Democracy Works. Democracy Works is produced by the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU Penn State, Central Pennsylvania's NPR station. Andy Grant is our engineer, and our editors are Mark Stitzer and Chris Kugler. Additional support comes from Ann Danahay, Emily Reddy, Shireen Stanford, Craig Johnson, and the rest of the team at WPSU. For more information on this episode and detailed show notes, visit our website at democracyworkspodcast.com. And if you like what you heard today, please leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening. Thank you.